Hey everyone, I'm Ben Norton, and this is Geopolitical Economy Report. Something that I talk about a lot here is the international move toward de-dollarization. What does that mean? The US dollar is the global reserve currency. It has a massive dominance over global trade, the economic and financial system. In fact, about 80% of international trade involves the US dollar. Even between countries that have nothing to do with the US, they often use dollars to trade with each other. And the US dollar is held in about 60% of the global reserves of central banks all around the world. But there's only one country on earth that can print the US dollar, which is the United States. This gives the US extreme financial and economic power. And in the 1960s, France's finance minister famously referred to this as the U.S. exorbitant privilege. Washington has an exorbitant privilege that, that is the economic exorbitant privilege, the economic power that undergirds its global empire. Today, I'm going to be talking about how China is challenging the dominance of the U.S. dollar. In fact, a Chinese newspaper, Global Times, said that the goal, this is an exact quote, is to, quote, counter U.S. dollar hegemony. And China is doing this in a few ways. One, its central bank is decreasing its holdings of dollars and buying more gold. And also China is doing currency swap agreements with other countries, encouraging them to use its currency, the yuan. So I have a report about this. I will link to it in the description below. I'm going to, of course, go into more detail about that. But before, I want to first briefly just explain how the U.S. dollar came to dominate the global economy. The system goes back to 1944 at the Bretton Woods Conference in which 44 countries got together and decided to make the U.S. dollar the global reserve currency. Now, at that time, the U.S. dollar was as good as gold because it was pegged to gold. It was backed by gold at the amount of, of $35 per ounce of gold. And then other currencies were pegged to the U.S. dollar. So basically, the currencies were based on gold. But in the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944, there were proposals made to instead have a global international trade currency that could be used to settle balance of payments issues. And the famous British economist John Maynard Keynes, who at that time was working with the British Treasury, he had actually proposed an international currency for trade that he called the Bancor. And he wanted to create an international clearing union. Why, why did he want to do that? So no single country would have hegemonic control over the global reserve currency, giving them that exorbitant privilege. Now, in, the, in 1971, the United States took the dollar off of gold. U.S. President Richard Nixon took the dollar off of gold. That, what does that mean? It means before, anyone who had dollars around the world could exchange those dollars for gold at the set rate of $35 per ounce of gold. In 1971, Richard Nixon took it off, and that meant that it became a freely floating fiat currency. Now, all those details, if you don't know a lot about economics, it doesn't matter. I mean, you don't need to know the important details about you know, how uh, freely floating currencies work and all of that. What I'm going to focus on today is the global campaign to challenge this system of dollar hegemony. We've seen many countries around the world have been trying to de-dollarize, especially countries that are targeted by the United States for sanctions. Because the United States has this power of the dollar as the global reserve currency, it means the U.S. can illegally, against international law, impose sanctions on countries that do devastating damage. For instance, Iran. Iran has been under sanctions for decades, ever since the 1979 revolution, and the U.S. can prevent Iran from accessing the, the international financial system, making it hard for Iran to trade with foreign countries because it can't get access to dollars. The U.S. has, of course, has had sanctions on Cuba since 1962, or even really before, but the U.S. has had a blockade on Cuba that also is extremely devastating and has really hurt the Cuban economy. And the U.S. has sanctions on China now and Venezuela and Nicaragua and Zimbabwe and the DPRK and so many countries. Eritrea, Syria is suffering under devastating sanctions. So what that means is that countries have been trying to create new international alternatives, financial alternatives to challenge the hegemony of the dollar doing trade in other currencies, and even central banks around the world are increasingly 
holding other assets in their reserves, the foreign exchange reserves of countries, central banks, not only other currencies like today, I'm going to talk about the Chinese yuan, but also gold. And today, those two points are key for what I'm going to talk about, how China is challenging U.S. dollar hegemony by one, the central bank is is slowly decreasing its its holdings of dollars and replacing them with other currencies and with gold. And Russia is doing the same thing. And the other main point I'm going to talk about today is how China is doing currency swap agreements with countries like Argentina, but also other countries in the world. And what is what is the point of this? It's a way to encourage these other countries to do trade with the Chinese yuan and not the US dollar. So bit by bit, we're seeing that China and also some other countries, you know, Russia, Iran, some Latin American countries, they are chipping away at US dollar hegemony. But of course, China has the world's largest economy, according to the measure purchasing power parity, which is a much better metric. If you're an average Chinese worker, you're not going to use dollars in your day to day life to buy products. Instead, we should look at the purchasing power of people in China and specifically of the Chinese currency, the yuan or renminbi, which is the same term. The Chinese currency has those two names. We should look at the purchasing power of the Chinese currency. And if you measure it in that way, which is called purchasing power parity, PPP, China has the largest economy in the world, larger than the US economy. What that means is that when China takes these decisions, carries out these kinds of actions on the international stage, they have massive global repercussions because we're not talking about a small country. We're talking about the most populous country on earth. I have a separate episode that I did on this. I have a report over at geopoliticaleconomy.com and there's a video and a podcast. I will link to it in the description below. In that, I discussed how Russia has been de-dollarizing and how the Russian central bank is going to be buying Chinese yuan on the foreign exchange market in order to stabilize its currency and do interventions in the foreign exchange market and not US dollars, which is another blow to US dollar, dollar hegemony. And increasingly, Russia and China are doing trade with each other, bilateral trade with the Chinese yuan. So China is buying Russian oil and gas with its own currency, the Chinese yuan, instead of the US dollar. Now, since the 1970s, the majority of global trade of oil has been done in dollars. And that's because of the petrodollar system. In the 1970s, the US pressured Saudi Arabia, which at that time was very much a uh, kind of client state. And Saudi Arabia agreed to sell its oil, to, to list its oil in the international market in dollars. And that has meant that since the 1970s, most oil has been sold in dollars. There were some leaders who tried to buck that trend and sell oil in other currencies. Famously, Saddam Hussein in Iraq, famously Muammar Gaddafi in Libya. We know what happened to them. They were overthrown in Western wars and regime change operations. But anyway, the point is that now we see this on a massive scale and it's growing everywhere we look. So in addition to China and Russia moving toward de-dollarization by doing trade with their currencies, the Chinese central bank is also joined by the Russian central bank in buying more and more gold. And this has been reported on by the financial press in the US. Bloomberg, which is a major media outlet owned by the billionaire oligarch Michael Bloomberg, it reported in December that China's central bank reported for the first time in three years that it was increasing its gold reserves. And they noted that central banks continue to accumulate gold with purchases estimated at a record of nearly 400 tons in the last quarter, this is in 2022. So the third quarter of 2022 and third fiscal quarter. And they noted that that's well above the previous high of 241 tons in the same period in 2018. So in four years, the it increased by about 40% from 241 tons of gold to 400 tons of gold held by central banks in their reserves. And Bloomberg pointed out that China's purchases may be part of a plan to diversify its reserves away from the dollar. Now, I, I agree 100%, but I wouldn't put maybe. It is definitely a plan. Many Chinese media outlets and government officials have made it clear that their goal is to diversify their foreign exchange reserves. There was another report in the financial press that was just published Janu in January that follows up 
once again, with China's central bank buying more gold, uh, Bloomberg pointed out that China reported an increase in its gold reserves for a second straight month, topping up holdings again after its first reported purchase in more than three years. And Bloomberg continued, were also published by Yahoo Finance. They, they noted that China's disclosure of its gold buying shed some light on the identity of these mysterious, of the mystery buyers. Market watchers speculate Russia could be another purchaser. Now, that's not a secret. Russia has made it clear that its central bank is buying more and more gold. Now, why is that? Well, Russia has been diversifying its foreign exchange reserves for years, going back to 2014, after the U.S.-backed coup in Ukraine in February 2014. The U.S back to coup that overthrew the democratic elected neutral president, Viktor Yanukovych, and installed a pro-Western regime. And then Russia annexed Crimea, and there was a democratic referendum in which even Western polling outlets admit that over 90% of people in Crimea wanted to join the Russian Federation. Historically, they had been part of Russia. They speak Russian. Anyway, in response, Western governments imposed sanctions on Russia and Russia began to diversify its foreign exchange holdings, recognizing that the U.S. and the European Union could simply steal the, the U.S. dollars and the euros that the Russian central bank holds. Because these days, most of what's held by central banks is not physical. It's in bank accounts. So the Russian central bank had bank accounts in different banks like the United States and Europe that were in U.S. dollars and in euros and those that 300 billion not million 300 billion with a with a b worth of us dollars and euro that belonged to russia that were owned by the russian central bank and were held in its foreign exchange reserves were steep were stolen were frozen by these western governments i want to repeat that western governments stole 300 billion dollars i mean it might be hard to imagine but we're talking about Many countries only have GDPs in the double digits, right? Smaller countries. We're talking about 300 billion. That's how much the West stole from Russia's central bank. And that sent shockwaves around the world because now central banks everywhere are saying, wait, the US and Brussels could decide they just wanna steal our foreign exchange reserves that belong to our governments. So more and more central banks around the world are trying to diversify their holdings. And this has been reported on also in the mainstream financial press. The Financial Times published an article back in June. It's titled, Central Banks Look to China's Renminbi to Diversify Foreign Currency Reserves. They, they noted that central banks are looking toward the Renminbi. I should point out, the Renminbi is the official formal name of the Chinese currency, but it's also frequently referred to simply as the Yuan. So, Renminbi and Yuan are the same thing. So let me go back to this article in Financial Times. Central banks are looking toward the Renminbi to diversify their foreign currency holdings in a sign that geopolitical flare-ups could chip away at the dollar's dominance. The proportion of central bank reserve managers that have invested in or are interested in investing in the Renminbi increased from 81% in 2021 to 85% in 2022. Now, this is an incredible figure. I want to repeat this for emphasis. 85% of the people who manage central bank reserves around the world are considering investing in the Chinese currency, the, the renminbi. This is a massive shift. Now, it's not a huge shift from last year, it's 81% last year, but it is a huge shift from 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. And it's part of this acceleration. I've said this many times in my analysis that de-dollarization is not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen even in a few years. We're talking about a process of decades, but it is not only happening, it is accelerating at a faster and faster pace. And there's an incredible quote here from the head of strategy for global sovereign markets at UBS, which is the top most important Swiss bank. And he said, quote, we're seeing a gradual erosion of the dollar. And he added, the picture that emerges is one of a multipolar currency system. So I've talked a lot about the increasingly multipolar world, and there's also a new multipolar financial system being created. 
And why is that? A significant part of that is because the United States and the European Union have weaponized their currencies, especially the US, the US and the US dollar. There are other countries that want access to euros if they want to, for instance, buy products in Europe to import those products, they will need to have euros. But for the most part, the US dollar is much more sought after because so much trade involves 80% of trade it involves US dollars. So that means that the US dollar is a whole new level. And that means that the US dollar, as I said, or the US government, as I said earlier, can impose illegal unilateral sanctions in violation of international law, but there are no consequences because the US has veto power at the UN Security Council. It opposes all attempts to reform the United Nations. It refuses to join the International Criminal Court. And the US passed a law called the Hague Invasion Act that says the US reserves the so-called right to invade the International Criminal Court at the, at the Hague if a US national or anyone of interest to US foreign policy is tried there for crimes against international law. So anyway, the point is that there are no legal consequences for the US, so it can impose sanctions on anyone. And this, this weaponization of the dollar has made the people of Cuba suffer for over 60 years, has made the people of the DPRK suffer for decades, the people of Zimbabwe and Eritrea, now Syria, people are suffering. It, it did massive damage to the Venezuelan economy, leading to hyperinflation, leading to tens of thousands of preventable deaths. And, and now we see these aggressive sanctions on Russia, but there's a big difference. Russia is not a small country. Russia is a massive country with a significant economy. And trying to impose those sanctions on a country like Russia showed the limits of the ability of Western sanctions and has accelerated this process of creating a new international financial system. So the irony is that by overusing the sanctions weapon, the US, dollar, the US government has been slowly chipping away at its own dollar hegemony. So let me go back to the Financial Times here. And they point out that four-fifths of the central bankers around the world say that, that were surveyed say they believe that a move toward a multipolar world away from a US-centric system would benefit the renminbi. So increasingly, people in in financial institutions, working in banks and markets, they recognize that we are moving toward a multipolar world. Now, the political class in the so-called West, in Washington and Brussels, they refuse to acknowledge this because they insist on maintaining this unipolar order in which Western colonial powers dominate the world, can extract the resources of global South, can explo exploit cheap labor and face no consequences. So. I did a report that's very related to this back over at geopoliticaleconomy.com. At that time, it was Multipolarista, but all the links at Multipolarista have now forwarded to geopoliticaleconomy.com. I will link to this in this report in the description below. And this was about the International Monetary Fund, that is the US-dominated financial institution, the IMF. They published a report in March that acknowledged that there is a, quote, erosion of dollar dominance. And they said there were several reasons, but two of the most important reasons were the rise of the Chinese yuan in international trade and being held in central bank reserves around the world and the Western sanctions on Russia creating alternatives to the Western-dominated financial system. Now, in this report that I did, again, the description is, in, is below, there are graphs that were that were from this IMF report. And the, this first graph shows the currency composi composition of foreign exchange reserves held by central banks around the world. And you can see that it goes from 1999 until 2021. The US dollar, which is the blue line, has historically been overwhelmingly the most commonly used currency in foreign exchange reserves. But in the past 20 years, the, the share of the U.S. dollar in foreign exchange reserves has declined. In around 2000, 70% of the foreign, reserve, foreign exchange reserves of central banks around the world was held in U.S. dollars. As of around 2020, 60%. So that's a 10% decline in the past 20 years. Like I said, de-dollarization is not going to happen overnight. But 
that 10% decline in the past 20 years is likely going to accelerate much more rapidly in the next 20 years. And there's another graph here that is in some ways more instructive because it shows that the decline in the holding of US dollars in foreign exchange reserves by central banks around the world is not being made up, not being replaced with other so-called traditional currencies. And when they say traditional currencies, they mean the so-called big four. Those were the currencies that were typically held by central banks around the world, which are the US dollar, the euro, the Japanese yen, and the British pound. Now, interestingly, the share of the Japanese yen and the British pound in, in foreign exchange reserves has been declining, and the euro, well, and the, and the dollar. And what that, what's that being replaced with is what they call non-traditional currencies, chief of which is the Chinese yuan. But there are other currencies as well, including the, the South Korean yuan, the Singapore dollar, and other currencies. The second graph from the IMF report shows the composition of the currencies held by central banks around the world. And around 2000, over 98% of those exchange currencies were held in the so-called big four of the US, the EU, Japan, and Britain. And that has declined to 90% around 2020 and 20 years. And in the meantime, the holding of so-called non-traditional reserve currencies has increased from under 2% in 2000 to roughly 10% as of 2020. So this, what, what does this mean? This is the visual representation of de-dollarization. Now, a few days after the IMF published that report on the quote, erosion of dollar dominance, a top IMF official did an interview with the Financial Times. And that article at the FT was titled, Russia sanctions threaten to chip away at dominance of US dollar. And the IMS first deputy managing director said that the Western sanctions include restrictions on Russia's central bank, and they could encourage, encourage, the, encourage the emergence of small currency blocks based on trade between separate groups of countries. That's exactly what I'm gonna be talking about in a bit here when I discuss how in Latin America, China is encouraging the use of the Chinese yuan for trade. And the, the top IMF official added that, quote, fragmentation at a smaller level is certainly quite possible. She did, however, note that the U.S. dollar will remain the major global reserve currency, even in that, that landscape. And I think that she's right. I don't think that's propaganda. Obviously, the IMF is very biased. It's, it, it's controlled by the U.S., which is the only country that has veto power. But she is right that, as I've been stressing, the U.S. dollar is not going to disappear overnight. De-dollarization also doesn't mean that countries are, not, are going to stop using dollars. What it means is that countries will have alternatives to the U.S. dollar. So the U.S. can't destroy their economy if, they're, if the people of that country elects a government that implements policies that Washington doesn't like or Brussels doesn't like. That's what a multipolar world means. It doesn't mean the end of U.S. hegemony and imperialism or European imperialism. It means that countries around the world, especially in the global South, have more possibilities to have independence and sovereignty and maintain an independent foreign and economic policy that isn't dictated by Washington. A key example of this shift toward a multipolar world can be seen in the expansion of the BRICS bloc, that is B-R-I-C, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. It's being expanded and now it's largely popularly called BRICS Plus, and we've seen many countries expressed interest in joining. Argentina and Iran have applied to join. And we've even seen that longtime Western allies like uh, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Turkey, formerly known as Turkey, Turkey, which is a member of NATO, even they have expressed interest in joining BRICS+. Plus. And Argentina, I mentioned, it has already applied to join. And Argentina has been attending BRICS summits as an honorary guest invited by the Chinese government. And this is an example of how even in Latin America, not just in Asia, we're seeing deeper integration of not only the Latin American region, Latin America and the Caribbean are trying to build a new currency or trying to integrate economically, but they're increasingly trying to economically integrate and politically integrate with countries in Asia and Africa. And, and to, to challenge the hegemony of the United States and Europe, which of course colonized them.
In the case of Argentina, it's very easy to understand why it's interested in trying to join BRICS. This is a country in South America that has been trapped in essentially neo-colonial debt going back 200 years. And a friend of mine who's a brilliant Argentine researcher, Esteban Almiron, he published a really good in-depth history uh, report detailing the long history of Argentina being trapped in debt, first with the British Empire and subsequently with the United States and with the IMF specifically. Argentina has suffered from numerous debt crises and defaults. And still today, Argentina is trapped in $44 billion of debt with the International Monetary Fund, which it can't pay off. And for people interested, I will link in the description below to this really good article detailing the history of Argentina's debt traps. But in response to this debt with the IMF, the Argentine president, the current Argentine president, Alberto Fernandez, he took a trip back in 2022 in February to both Beijing and Moscow to meet with Chinese President Xi Jinping and Russian President Vladimir Putin. And the Argentine president, who's not a revolutionary, he's basically a centrist, and he he made it clear. I mean, this is not Hugo Chavez. Hugo Chavez, the revolutionary leader of Venezuela, is was himself, he had been calling for a multipolar world back in 1998 when he was running for president, one year before he entered office in 1999. So, I mean, the revolutionary leaders in Latin America have been, they were the earliest calling for a multipolar world and accelerating this drive against, uh, for de-dollarization against the hegemony of the US dollar. But now we even see more centrist leaders in Latin America who recognize that they need to find alternatives. And in February, when he was in Beijing, Argentine President Fernandez announced that Argentina was officially joining China's Belt and Road Initiative. And he did that right around the same time that Cuba joined the Belt and Road Initiative and also Nicaragua and its Sandinista government joined the Belt and Road Initiative. So this is part of a growing alliance between China and Russia and countries in Latin America who want to defend their sovereignty against U.S. imperialism. The United States has invaded dozens of countries in Latin America, has organized dozens of coups d'etat, not only historically, but even recently, like 2019 in Bolivia, 2016 to 2018 in Brazil, 2009 in Honduras, and the list goes on and on. Peru right now as we speak. So people in Latin America, many leaders, are looking across the oceans to find new allies. So this brings me to the latest news showing how Argentina and China are working together to advance de-dollarization. Of course, the majority of Argentina's debt is denominated in US dollars, especially the IMF debt, and it, it only has a limited amount of dollars. And this is a, a significant reason for the inflation crisis in Argentina. The Argentine peso, which is its currency, has been devaluing very heavily against the US dollar, largely because it can't get access to enough dollars to both pay its debt and to stabilize its currency. So this is where China comes in. This January, the president, the, the president of Argentina's central bank and the governor of China's central bank met and they announced that they are going to create a currency swap deal. And this is according to a press release published on the official website of Argentina's central bank. They say that the currency swap between the two countries' central banks aims to reinforce Argentina's international reserves with 130 billion yuan, which in uh, U.S. dollars would be about 19 billion U.S. dollars, with an additional 35 billion in yuan as what they call a, a special activation, which is another additional around 5 billion U.S. dollars. But... I, I always hate, you know, uh, converting it to U.S. dollars because the point of this currency swap is to remove the U.S. dollar from Argentine-China relations. That's the point of this. I mean, China's also trying to help Argentina, with, which is dealing with this inflation crisis and debt crisis. And of course, China, it's in its interest to expand its relations with Argentina and to have more allies in Latin America. But China said, actually, sorry, it wasn't even China. It was the Argentine Central Bank that said in this press release, they said that both institutions dedicated themselves to deepen, deepening the use of the renminbi in the Argentine market for bilateral trade.
That is a very significant line. What does that mean? It means that more and more, China and Argentina are discussing doing trade with each other in their respective currencies, not the US dollar. This is a game changer for Argentina. Now, I should, I should, maybe I shouldn't exaggerate too much because this policy is not new. It goes back to 2009 when Argentina's left-wing president, Cristina Fernández de Kirchner, she originally is the one who had the idea of signing currency swap agreements with China. And so it's not new, but it's significant because the Argentine Central Bank, they're pledging to use the renminbi in bilateral trade. So how does that work? A currency swap is basically like a loan, but it's a, it's a different kind of loan. And especially considering a lot of loans are denominated in US dollars, the way it works is that the Argentine Central Bank has its own account in the Chinese Central Bank, which is known as the People's Bank of China. And that account is in Argentine pesos. And the Chinese, the Chinese Central Bank, the People's Bank of China, has its own account in the Argentine Central Bank, but that account is in Chinese Yuan. So China is, is giving the Argentine Central Bank 100 billion, 130 billion yuan, and Argentina and China agree to a fixed exchange rate that won't change, and Argentina pays back China with its yuan, the, the yuan that it earns, which is, so Argentina has to get 130 billion yuan and pay back China, and then China has to pay back Argentina with the equivalent amount they agreed to in Argentine pesos. So people might ask, why is that a big deal? Well, this is a way, one, for Argentina to hold on to its dollars. So it doesn't need to, to convert its currency into dollars to, to do trade. It can instead use the dollars it has to pay off its dollar denominated debt. Unfortunately, that's mostly what the dollars go to, right? And it can instead use the Chinese yuan to stabilize its currency in the foreign exchange market. So Argentina has a significant problem with a destabilizing, with a uh, devaluing currency against the dollar. There's a lot of inflation in Argentina. So what Argentine central bank can do is it can use money from its central bank reserves and it can buy its own currency on the foreign exchange markets. And what that does is it increases the demand for its currency and increases the price. And that's a way they can stabilize it and help stave off inflation. But, but Argentine, Argentina can only do that if it has foreign exchange reserves. If it's running very low in its foreign exchange reserves, obviously it can't. And that's one of the reasons for the, the inflation, the constant, constantly devaluing Argentine peso because so, much, so many of its dollars go to pay off its external debt denominated in dollars. But there's another significant advantage for China and for the global attempt at de-dollarization. What this means is that now it will incentivize Argentine exporters and importers to do trade with China with the Chinese yuan, not with the US dollar. Because one of the only ways that Argentina can get access to foreign currencies is through exports. And as I'll talk about in a second, Argentina is a major agricultural producer. So when it exports its products to a country like China, a Chinese importer can buy those with Chinese yuan instead of US dollars. That way, China and Argentina can just completely remove the middleman of the US dollar. No more US dollars, they don't wanna deal with that. Instead, China can pay, the Chinese importer can pay the Argentine exporter with yuan, and then those yuan end up in the Argentine central bank, and then eventually it can pay off the currency swap, the 130 billion yuan it owes to China, instead of having to convert everything to dollars. So what is China thinking about doing this currency swap? After all, with the Argentine peso being increasingly devalued, it's not a very valuable currency. So why would China want to do this? Well, one, it's a, as I say, it's a way of de-dollarizing their trade. And the Global Times, which is a Chinese newspaper, acknowledge this. The Global Times represents a kind of nationalist wing of the Communist Party of China. It's closely linked to the government. But there are different editorial perspectives in China, and this is the more nationalist one. And they published an article titled China-Argentina Expand Currency Swap Scale as Closer Economic Ties Boost Yuan's Use in Latin America. And they note here that China and Argentina have expanded a currency swap deal which will help the Latin American country, that's Argentina, hedge against shocks 
brought about by the U.S. financial policy tightening. They're referring to the U.S. central bank increasing interest rates, which decreases the liquidity of dollars around the world, which makes it even harder for Argentina to get the dollars it needs to pay off the $44 billion it owes to the IMF, plus interest, of course. And they say that this plan will help Argentina promote its own industrial development. And this is the money quote. This is the most important quote. Global Times writes, quote, it is likely that more Latin American countries will increase the use of Chinese yuan in order to counter the U.S. dollar's hegemony and strengthen economic ties with China. It quoted a professor at Renmin University in China who said that as Argentina, it, it notes that the deal indicates that Argentina is determined to seek loans from China to gear up development as the Latin American country has before tasted the U.S. dollar hegemony and, and how Argentina slid into a debt crisis as a result. So they're very clearly hinting at exactly what I've been saying, that this is aimed, one, at increasing relations between China and Argentina, a country that wants to join the BRICS, and it's a way of de-dollarizing. So, so Argentina and China can do trade with each other with other currencies that don't involve the U.S. dollar. Now, the thing about Argentina is, in addition to having to constantly pay its foreign currency debt, which means a constant outward flow of foreign currency, it's a country that has long suffered with, with a current account deficit, which means that many in many years, not, well, actually right now, yeah, yes, but um, in the past few years, it did manage to have a current account surplus, but it mostly has a current account deficit. That means that it tends to import more than it exports. And countries that import more than they export tend to have problems with inflation because their currency devalues, because there's less demand for their currency, and there's more demand for foreign currencies, which means that they often exchange their own currency, they sell their currency on the foreign exchange market, and buy foreign currencies in order to import, and that means that every time they sell their currency and buy the other currency, their currency devalues against that other currency. So this is an issue that Argentina has had. So one of the ways of getting around it is through increasing its exports. If you look at uh, statistics of Argentina's uh, trade, this is from Santander, you can see that the main Argentine exports in order are oil-derived products, around 14%, corn, 11%, soy products, 11%, meat, largely beef, at 4%, and wheat, around 4%. And specifically, if you look at data on, this is from an, an Argentine importer website, if you look at data on trade between Argentina and China, Argentina mostly exports to China agricultural products. In two thirds of that, 66% is soybeans, 7% is soy oil. So nearly three quarters of what Argentina exports to China is are soy products, but it also exports beef, crude petroleum, and shrimp and prawn. And on the other side, China mostly exports to Argentina uh, te telephones, TVs, technology, and machines. So that's clearly a trade imbalance. That And the point that Global Times said is that Argentina is trying to increase its own industrial production and not relying simply on exporting raw materials and food. But Argentina does have an advantage that's not that well known, and that is that Argentina does actually have shale gas and shale oil reserves, and they're not small. Argentina actually, believe it or not, has the world's second largest shale gas reserves and the fourth largest shale oil reserves. But a lot of that isn't really produced, although, as I'll talk about in a bit here, Argentina and Brazil are building a pipeline to send some of that gas to Brazil. Now, before I conclude talking about the relations between Argentina, Brazil, and China, I want to look briefly at an article that was published in the Wall Street Journal in December. It's very dismissively titled, China Props Up Belt and Road Bor Borrowers Via Unusual Channel. The People's Bank of China uses currency swap lines to support governments that borrowed heavily from Chinese banks. So this is similar to what 
China has been doing with Argentina, but it actually has been doing it with between 20 and 40 countries. I've seen different estimates here. So China has been doing currency swaps with, with around 20 countries, not only Argentina, but also Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Laos. And these are countries that exchange their domestic currencies for Chinese yuan. Again, it's a kind of loan, but it's a loan that, that removes the middleman of the US dollar. So this is, again, part of the drive toward de-dollarization. And the Wall Street Journal, again, very dismissively, the Wall Street Journal has a very biased anti-China editorial slant. They say this is part of an effort by Chinese authorities to prop up governments that borrowed heavily from Chinese banks as part of Beijing's Belt and Road Initiative. It's a, it's a massive global infrastructure pro project. And they note that by replenishing other countries' reserves, the People's Bank of China may be helping some of the world's most indebted countries avoid rising borrowing costs. They, they act as if this is something bad. They act as if this is a crime to help countries avoid rising borrowing costs. I mean, what they really prefer is the U.S. World Bank and IMF model, where the U.S. imposes political conditions on countries. They have to they cut the minimum wage. They have to privatize state-owned companies. They have to liberalize and deregulate their markets. They have to uh, cut regulations and workers' protections in order to take in order to take loans from the IMF and the World Bank. China has no political conditions for people who who borrow from it. That's what that's what really makes you know the uh, you know journalists at Wall Street Journal and and analysts in Washington angry. So it has some graphs here showing the foreign exchange exchange reserves of countries like Laos. You can see that Laos came very close to running out of its running out of money in its foreign exchange reserves, and thanks to the uh, the currency swap line from China, it it doubled its nearly doubled its uh, foreign exchange reserves. Same for Sri Lanka, although not nearly as much, but it did. Uh, Sri Lanka has had an issue where it ran out of foreign exchange reserves and has been struggling with inflation. It couldn't pay for imports. So China has helped there as well. And the Wall Street Journal says that it writes that the People's Bank of China says the swap lines are there to help grease the wheels of international trade, ensure financial stability and further the adoption of the yuan in a world where trade and finance are dominated by the U.S. dollar. So this explains it. It's not some nefarious Chinese plot. Why do countries want to take these currency swaps? Because typically, I should have said this earlier, typically in a currency swap, the interest rate is lower than a loan. That's why countries are so interested. These deals tend to be quite favorable for countries that do currency swaps. And again, their currency swaps done with their currency and the Chinese yuan, not involving another foreign currency. So yes, China, what it gets out of it is encouraging the use of the yuan in international trade and challenging the hegemony of the US dollar, which is objectively good for everyone outside of the US. It helps strengthen the sovereignty economically and by extension politically of all countries so they don't have to be slaves to the US controlled financial system, always worrying about how to get more dollars to pay off their debt and to import foreign products, especially countries that are not energy sovereign countries that don't produce oil or gas and have to import have to import energy that means they need to get access to a lot of foreign currency namely us dollars and this is going to help them so people talk about we're seeing the rise of the petro yuan as opposed to the petro dollar okay continuing the people's bank of china's swap lines are broader in scope and can be used by foreign central banks to address balance of payments needs. That's what the Wall Street Journal acknowledged. The People's Banks of Ch the Chinese Central Bank's swap network is the largest of its kind, according to the World Bank. The People's Bank of China said in a 2021 report that it had swap facilities with 40 countries with combined capacity of almost 4 trillion yuan or about 570 billion US dollars. That's, that's an insane, that's a huge, huge, huge amount of money. So I just wanted people, I want people to get the, the scope, to have an understanding of the scope of what we're talking about here. Now, this is a very interesting graph that shows the, the it shows Argentina's foreign exchange reserves. 
And this, this is, I'll update in a second here, but this shows as of 2021, the Argentine central bank reserves held, you know, as currencies or gold officially by the Argentine central bank. And then comparing it to the yuan uh, credit swap deal. And you can see that basically now Argentina's central bank is eff effectively holding half of its reserves in the Chinese yuan. That is a massive shift. And according to the most recent data from the Argentine Central Bank, which was from November 2022, Argentina had 38 billion US dollars worth of its foreign exchange reserves. And the new credit line from China is estimated at 19 billion. So that's to say that the new credit line in Yuan from China is half the size of Argentina's foreign exchange reserves. This is a very significant shift. Now, finally, I'm going a little long today. I'm going to conclude looking at Brazil's role in all of this, which is very interesting. On January 1st, Brazil's leftist president, Lula da Silva, returned to power, and immediately he uh, increased the integration of Brazil with other countries in Latin America, restored ties with Venezuela, and Brazil and Argentina are increasing their, their trade between each other. Brazil is... Argentina's biggest trading partner, and China is Argentina's second biggest trading partner, and China is Brazil's biggest trading partner. So these three countries are very big countries. Brazil is the largest country in Latin America with the largest economy, and it's the sixth most populous country on earth. And Argentina has the third largest economy in Latin America. So we're seeing this kind of triangular relationship between China, Brazil, and Argentina, of course, China and Brazil are founding members of the BRICS block, and Argentina is likely going to join the BRICS plus block. Now, the new leftist president of Brazil, Lula da Silva, he officially took power. He, his inauguration was on January 1st. And then two days later, on January 3rd, Argentina's ambassador in Brazil, Daniel Schioli, met with the Brazilian economic minister, Fernando Haddad, and in this meeting, the Argentine ambassador to Brazil said they had three main priorities. One is an agreement on deep integration of Argentina and Brazil that Argent Argentina's president Alberto Fernandes and Brazil's president Lula are going to sign at the next meeting of the CELAC in Buenos Aires, which is happening at the end of, J of January. The CELAC is the Community of Latin American and Caribbean States. It is a regional organization that was made as an alternative to the U.S.-controlled Organization of American States, excluding the U.S. and Canada. The Argentine ambassador added that in his meeting with the Brazilian economic minister, the second issue on their agenda was creating a plan to increase trade between them. And here's the, the really important point. He said that they want to increase bilateral trade, but they want to cons conserve the reserves of both countries and the framework of a system of local currency. What he's hinting at here is that Brazil and Argentina are going to try to find ways to do trade by de-dollarizing so they don't have to use their reserves like U.S. dollars. And this goes back to something that Lula da Silva has talked about, which is his idea of creating a new pan-Latin American currency to end Latin America's dependence on the U.S. dollar. And this would be a currency not like the EU, each country would still in Latin America have their sovereign currency. It would instead be a currency like what was proposed by John Maynard Keynes at the Bretton Woods Conference, the Bancor idea. It would be a current of account that would be used for international trade so they can settle balance of payments issues without having to use the foreign currency they have in their foreign exchange reserves. And finally, another very interesting comment that was made here is that Argentina's ambassador to Brazil said that they're discussing a plan in which a Brazilian state-owned development bank is going to provide financing for Argentina to expand the construction of a pipeline, a gas pipeline, that is named after the former left-wing president, Nestor Kirchner. The pipeline is called Nestor Kirchner Pipeline. And they said the goal is to provide a sustainable supply of gas to Brazil, to Brazil and that could, that could help them to balance their balance of payments issues between the countries. So he talked about 
more integration with Brazil, more growth, jobs, and foreign currencies for Argentina. So this is another significant development. And of course, China plays a role in all of this because China is Brazil's largest trading partner. China is Argentina's second largest trading partner. And Brazil is Argentina's largest trading partner. Finally, this is a tweet from Brazil's new president, Lula da Silva, on January 2nd, one day after he entered office. Immediately, he met with China's vice president, Wang Kishan. And in that meeting, the Chinese vice president gave Lula a letter from Chinese President Xi Jinping. And Lula said that, that in that letter, Xi Jinping called for amplifying, for um, strengthening, boosting their cooperation. And he said that China is our biggest trading partner and we can even more, even further expand our relations between countries. So what this shows once again is that we're seeing integration within Latin America. We're seeing integration of Latin America with Asia, and we're seeing a global campaign to challenge the hegemony of the US dollar. And why is that? Because countries around the world are tired of being bullied and oppressed by the United States. This imperial power that imposes sanctions on them, that steals their foreign exchange reserves, not only of the R Russian central bank, the US and EU also stole the foreign exchange reserves of the central banks of Venezuela, of Iran, of Afghanistan, the list keeps growing. And what, what that means is that that economic warfare waged by the West against independent sovereign countries, largely in the global South, and largely represented now by the BRICS, has backfired majorly. And we now see the emergence of a multipolar world, not only with political institutions, but a new multipolar world with new economic and financial institutions. So I want to thank everyone. If you like this program, please consider supporting our work here at Geopolitical Economy Report. You can go to geopoliticaleconomy.com slash support, or you can go to patreon.com slash geopoliticaleconomy. We have a lot more exciting coverage coming very soon. I'm Ben Norton, and I'll see you next time.